And welcome back to this is Dunder Mo Dunder. <laughs> this is Dunder Moose. I can say my name, right? It is. Uh, it's four a.m. here in Michigan. Uh, it is. It is nighttime where my guest is John Mollison. Um, if you wanted to know what the Bro SR is, chances are you learned it from this guy. Uh, oh. His videos are how I learned. Other than that, there's what? There's B-Dubs wrote an article about it, and, or you could be reading the Trilopulous Session reports. Uh, but I'm excited to have John on. You've been doing some really cool stuff lately with solo play. Well, thank and you so for that. I want to acknowledge that I'm not caught up. I've been listening to it as I drive to work and whenever I have to do spreadsheets and stuff, like that's there with me. So I'm, I'm a few sessions behind. Uh, but very fascinating stuff with uh, Advanced Dungeons Dragons First Edition. Uh, but the reason that I've asked you on today is because I am interested in this Bronstein thing. So for those that may not know what the heck I'm talking about, do you want to kind of walk us through what sure. we are playing sure. with? Let's, we do this let's, let's take care of a little business first, though. I go by Mr. Wargaming. I do have a YouTube channel, for those that don't know. And just for those of you that doubt that I am who I say I am, here's the hands. And, and I've even got, if I have to lean in to read my screen, I've even got the, the eye to prove it. So with that out of the way, um, yeah, we, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about patron play tonight, right? Yes. And that's, patron that's the play. big, that's the big mystery. That's the big like puzzle that's still kind of hanging out there. We've been experimenting for a couple of years and, and we're still not exact. We haven't quite got our arms around it yet. So it's it's a fertile field for conversation. Um, yeah, and I, I, it may it may be one of the more controversial because it is such a radical departure from the conventional style of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so so where where would you like to start? Well, uh, we could start with uh, Secrets of Blackmore, right? Okay, what we learned watching that about what Major uh, David Wesley did back in the day, and then try and see how that might connect to what people are experimenting with nowadays okay well if you don't mind i i think maybe we should start by defining our terms we should we should Please. help people understand what we mean by patron play so they're all operating on kind of a level playing field and um it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people but you know if, if you boil it down to its fundamentals all it means is you as the player are adopting the role of of a persona who has goals and resources to achieve them and some kind of organizational structure that you have to manage in order to achieve those goals. So in conventional D&D, &D, you are typically playing one character and you don't have an organization. Now, that's not strictly true. Eventually, over time, you can grow a, a an organization. But in the modern iteration of Dungeons and Dragons, mm. you typically offload all of the logistics onto the DM the same way you do most of the rules, where if you do have an organization, they're NPCs that the DM manages. Or if you're the head of a knightly order, you just kind of like hand wave and arm wave all of that stuff away. But, you know, I, I think something to be aware of is that we've all played patron games before. If you've ever played Axis and Allies, in a sense, that's a patron style game. You know, you, you are point. the head of a nation and you've got in, in you know, it's, it's fairly abstract. You've got little plastic army men and tanks and planes and your goal is to take territory. And so, you, but you also have research that you have to do and where you divert your funds directs where, and, and people, for some reason, you know, they understand that they get that it's not a problem, but when you start to approach dungeons and dragons from that perspective, people clench up. Yeah. Because what they want is just the story. They want them. They want to play the movie that they sat in the movie theater and watched, which is a passive style game. They want to be and Kirk we, and Spock. Exactly. But forgetting that Kirk is the captain of a vessel that has, what, like 400 people on it? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, he could very well send an away team down. And, you know, in some cases he does. One of the, most, one of the best films of all, Star Trek II, Kirk doesn't go down to meet the people on, uh, what yeah. is it, SETI Omicron 7? Six, what you would you, you, the Star Trek nerds know what I'm talking about? Yeah, <laughs> he sends <laughs> right now. and then wouldn't you know it? Because you know, he didn't handle it himself, he couldn't, he had other things going on that introduced some some conflict and adventure down the road. Yeah, um, 
but so when we talk about patron play, what we're really talking about is trying to codify a game uh, that involves the the logistical and managerial challenges of um, managing your resources and directing NPCs or portions of your organization to areas where you don't necessarily have the same amount of control, right? So yeah. That's one thing to be aware of. And the other thing to be aware of is that, I mean, we all know what a patron is because we've all been hired by the wizard, you know, that, that we probably shouldn't have trusted in the end. Yeah. Had a map or the innkeeper that had a rat problem in his basement, you know, or the king whose daughter was going to get eaten by the dragon. Like, that's the patron. And the mm -hmm. question that Bro SR keeps asking is why do all of these fun things have to be reserved to the DM? I, yeah. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a wizard and I've got a thousand gold pieces and it only costs a gold a day to hire some thug to go beat up my rival. Why wouldn't I just go hire a hundred guys to go beat him up? Like that's that's an option that's on the table in mm -hmm. any style of D&D. &D. And so that's where I think the Bro SR has really elevated the game and kind of changed the nature of the game by grabbing all of these things that normally we reserve to the DM and saying, no, I'm going to do that too. Yeah. And right? one of the questions, sorry, it's getting loud here. My This time of night, my, soft, my water softener likes to cycle. Oh, so. not at all. I, I don't fine. know if you're not. We can, um, I got a bird over here that's likely to start screaming. So okay. we'll be fine. We'll get through. So, so Paul in the chat says, one issue with the patron play discussion is that there's not been much of an attempt to actually codify it. And uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. A yeah. little bit. But one of the reasons for that is that it is very experimental, right? Like, um, yes or no. Uh, you okay. know, the, uh, I, this was the original style of the game that would become D D. that's right and so at this point you know uh, uh, mr moose mr do, do i call you dunder or mr moose you can call me dunder all right so my name is John you tell me well, like so it's, it's not confusing just call me Dunder. like let, let's go to the beginning where you know guys were playing miniature war games on a on a ping pong table yeah, and they they started to experiment with the notion of and and you know what it is every time you play a game, and um, like miniature war gamers are notorious for this. If you've ever played in a game where there's like a French foreign legion against mm -hmm. you know the, the you know doing colonial against the 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 Toregs is was my first experience, or guys playing orcs in 40k, they're always screaming wah right. They yeah. always start talking like soccer hooligans. That's natural. That's part and parcel to like identify so strongly with the things on the table yeah. that you start to role play as them. And so these guys back in uh, the Twin Cities area said, well, what if what if we took that kind of role play experience and made a little mini game out of that? And that's the Braunsteins that yeah, people have been talking about for a while. And one clever fellow said, hmm. What if I just ignored all of the like war gamey stuff and focused on that little role play stuff, Dave Arneson? Yeah, and he took that ball and ran with it. And you know, it the the development of D and D quickly shed its war gaming roots in large part due to the fact that I think Gary Gygax turned over the writing of this game that he didn't fully understand to non war gamers, and he didn't understand how to sell them non-war gamers on the war gaming aspect so i think that what we're doing here is a return to tradition it's a return okay. to the form and to the original and and uh, you know if you think about it like like the game has evolved in one direction and all we've done is said what if we re reverse the clock and see what happens if we take a different path and th uh, that's led to some you know some some gears being very ground and and some you know it, there's some chafing involved when you do that but, yeah uh, well because part one of that is three back at the apex carried out you'll get quite a difference right sure sure the angle. so i don't so i don't know that i get but however you know when you compare the kind of narrative approach to role-playing games small yes. band of heroes followed from level one to 20 we've had 40 years to experiment and refine and see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And with this aspect of patron play, we haven't. It's largely been ignored. So the <laughs> fact that we've been experimenting for two years has led to some, some interesting discoveries, A, that it's possible, some interesting failures, which we're going to get to. Well, I, I don't want to call them failures, though. 
what yeah. we have are some some yeah, cautionary tales some some bumps along the road to wisdom you know it's natural it's like science in the lab right e exactly exactly so the first one that i became aware of of this new style of doing it was um in a 5e campaign uh chanticleer was was playing um in in uh water deep and if you've read that module there's a lot of crime lords and you can pick which one for the season or whatever and he was just like i can't be bothered to run all these guys why don't i just put some of my friends in charge of the big bats is that it? but i'm johnny come lately to this so i don't know if there were people doing that before that that were making a splash if if there were they were very quiet about it okay. and they're they they it was a one-off bit that they did and then they stopped Mm -hmm. um and 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 i think that that i i'm sure there have been lots of examples of that but be, because chanticleer was the guy that did that we started calling it we we mashed up his name with dave arneson's name and the original name for for patron play was chantisonian okay um and so the idea that so that i i think the next like biggest dinner and, and that's let's let's not move off that too quickly yeah what did he gain There's, by doing that i i think i think one of the keys to be aware of is that there are probably as many ways to run patron play as there are people running it yes um there's and, and that's that you know, one of the beauties of advanced dungeons and dragons is that it scales really well the combat scales you can run one v one and it's a lot of fun. And then you can bump up to five on five, 10 on 10, 100 on 100, 1,000 on 1,000, because it's 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 fractal. You can just kind of keep zooming out. And, you know, as long as you're using ratios, the whole system works really well. That's part of the genius. And um, just as like mass combat in conventional D&D &D is, well, we'll just do five people on five people and, and then we'll map that to the larger conflict or pretend like yeah. the larger conflict isn't even happening. We'll just focus on the like the fight at the bridge and that'll determine the battle. Well, we're saying, no, no, no. If I want to role play as the general, I want to play as the hero Conan leading his his war band of a thousand guys. I want to be able to send a hundred guys this way, a hundred guys that way and, you know, save the, yeah. the hundred near me. So, um, you know, that's, I, I'm sorry, get a little off here. Um, one of the ways that you can run patron is very simple. If you are playing Dungeons and Dragons right now, and you are in a conventional campaign where you're using stop time and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you, you go down to the game shop for game for four hours once a week. If you're the DM and you've got six or seven factions involved, and you don't know what this faction is going to do. You've got a, a thieves guild that's trying to take over the city. And you've got the aldermen that's trying to prevent them. And you've got, you know, whatever the king is trying to, to stop them. And the church is, of course, trying to do its influence. But mo modern day politics mapped down to the fantasy world. Yeah. And you've got five guys. You don't know what you don't want to be able to juggling all these balls. You don't want to have to get into the heads of all five guys. So you just go to one of your friends who's not playing in the campaign and say, hey, if you were the head of this thieves guild, and you had to make this decision, what would you do? That's that's a style of patron play that's valid. Yeah. Um, well, and that's been, you. that's been my experience with it, too. Like, I was doing Keep on the Borderlands. I just put one of my buddies in charge of the the, the priest that, like, betrays them inevitably. And I put one okay. of my buddies... I put one of my buddies in charge of the um, the Cobalt. He's, he was, you know, because that was the first yep. cave they went in was the Cobalt. They had a disastrous first encounter and a guy got captured. And I asked the Cobalt guy, hey, you got this guy. You could eat him. You could give him for ransom. What do you want? And he said, I want to give him for ransom and I want an ogre. And it blew my mind because I never would have thought of that. Right. And suddenly and so, the ogre is moving from the goblins across the valley. Yeah. And now now that's the player's problem. They got to figure out. They were like, the, the goblins have an ogre. We want our own. And it's like. It's just up to them. Oh, e even better. Yep. So that was and, and now you've changed the power dynamic, and yeah. you're running a unique version of the Keep on the Borderlands that no one's ever seen before. Because it's yeah, just because, for that one question, hey, yeah, what would you do here? But that's a different kind of thing than another person who hits their patrons. Like that's that's one of the things I want to get to with Disembork is like you've got some patrons that enter a game and 
to them, they're like competing for the attention of the party. Like, how do I make sure they take my hooks? How do I make sure they bring me magic items? And then you've got another kind of patron who's like, this is a war game. I may or may not use the players. I'm going to defeat the other patrons. Right. So let's go. Let's move on to the next big step. It like forward in technology after the Chantis, uh, Chanticleer used his Lords of Waterdeep. And that was probably, I, I, um, uh, oh, who was it? There, there was a guy that was running, it was called Burning Sands, and it was basically Mars with Mongols and King Cole. And um, he he did that. He said, look, I'm going to give each of you guys five patrons, and, and you have a, a high-level NPC with a war band. And he had a few guys sign up and essentially do almost a narrative war game where he asked them what their plans were. And, and here's one of the keys of patron play is that the DM does not have to be aware of what the players are doing until he does, until there is a ruling that needs to be achieved. The, the players are free to march their armies hither and yon, but it's only when you find yourself in some kind of friction that you don't know how to resolve it yeah. that the DM has to get involved. And this is similar to, again, I'm going to go back to the war games, the, 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 the spring, the fountain from which D&D sprung. Um, you've got asymmetric knowledge and you've got, you know, armies moving across a map and you've got one guy who is the literal referee. He doesn't make up anything. He doesn't control any of the the teams or the sides or the armies he's just there to adjudicate and make sure that everybody's on the same page and that was what um dan davies is his name he he writes the brain leakage blog and that's what he experimented with it worked really well uh for i don't know probably about three or four months i actually ran um the the siege of a major city for them as an actual war game and that was where we started to discover that because he was running it as a D&D campaign, the language was already in place to be able to translate from the campaign to like a tabletop war game. Okay. Mine was even kind of narrative, but it was it was largely just kind of the same kind of narrative of, well, let's see what happens when you've got these different strategies at play. And they're so complicated. You know, are you bribing the gatekeeper? Are you attacking the citadel? Are you sneaking in through the sewers? That that's where the GM comes in. And he has to adjudicate all those those differing commands and strategies. Um, and and you know, there's the uncertainty. There's just pure random chance where you you don't want to decide. I don't know. You know, I would give these guys a ninety percent chance of success, and you roll a ninety nine, and they fail. Yeah. Okay, you're letting the dice decide for you. That's you know, that's part of the games that we play. It strikes um, me for, that this style of play requires a level of trust that people aren't used to doing in, in board games. I In board games, sure. But what's funny is uh, people place, uh, again, I, I've heard it said before that this requires a level of trust that, that isn't present in D&D. And I don't think so because people trust the DM. Yeah. The question is, why are you only trusting one of the guys at the table? You know, you, why don't you afford the same courtesy and the same level of trust to the player on the other side where you 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 do like the same player when you're playing a game of diplomacy you trust him you know you trust that these guys are going to write their orders correctly but then you mm-hmm. move to D and suddenly the only guy I trust is behind the screen i i don't well, understand is that. it because it's theater of the mind like in axis and allies you can see how many aircraft carriers he has and where they are on the map but if you take away the map, how do I know the other guy's not fudging it and moving one extra spot on his turn? You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. It just takes trust. You got to say, these are people that I, I'm... I, I, exactly. Yeah. We're, we're all committing to the fun of playing this the way it's supposed to be. Sure. The trust sure. also, I think, because of Fog of War, you need more trust in your DM than you might normally put in them. Uh, because you may not know all the things that go into the role of that 99 that you just threw. You may right. you may not know other plans that other people have done that would jack up your stuff. And you just think, well, this is a lock. I got it. And then he tells you, no, it failed. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you just got to say, all right, I'm going to trust everybody I'm playing with. And then yeah, and, you're playing with people who speak your alignment language. And there are things you can do 
to like prove that trust. So what, when I did that, I would, I would outline my, all of my, my reasoning. This is, you know, 90%. And then I'd roll, but in my case, I was doing it on camera because we we live all around the country, all the globe. Um, but I, you know, after you've, you've done that a couple of times, I, I think that's where the, the trust building comes in. Yeah. And ultimately I don't know that I could game with people I don't trust. Right on. So, that, so from there, and, and that worked reasonably well. It was a fun time that probably lasted two or three months. And then Dan stepped away from the, from GMing for personal reasons. Um, and from there, I think the next big leap was uh, we were sitting around in the, in a group chat talking about the missed opportunity of Ravenloft. And I think all of your viewers probably un- remember Ravenloft. It was a second edition module. Well, first of all, it was a, the Castle Ravenloft was a first edition module, I-6, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, chat can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and it was, you know, classic vampire. You, you get transported to a pocket dimension. And then it was so popular that, and it was a bit of a narrative style game, that uh, with, uh, TSR at the time turned it into a whole setting. And in their setting... All of these powerful, like demi liches and, and extraordinarily powerful, like demigods, were condemned to an ironic hell of their own creation. So the mummy was trapped in a a, a desert, you know, in a tomb in a desert. Yeah. He's All eternally alive. Uh, exactly. But Ravenloft dropped the ball because they were so wedded to the narrative style of play that they said, "Don't worry. There's like." The, the walls of the prison are red mists that when players encounter one monster, they can only encounter that one. And we were saying, man, that would be terrible. That's, you know, who wouldn't, I mean, hammer horror, right? Who does not want to see the mummy throw down against the vampire? Yeah. Who wouldn't want to see, you know, the, um, man, I don't know, you know, the, the mad scientist and his his zombie monsters marching against the mummy. And that one of the things that um, somebody, one of the innovations from that game is that some madman named Castutus Calvitus stepped up and he volunteered. He said, I'll run this. And yeah. people immediately started claiming factions. I want to be the vampire. I want to be the mummy. I want to be the lizard man. I want to be... And somebody said, we need a good guy. I'm going to be Rome. I'm going to be the young Pope from TV's young Pope, uh, which was fun. And and the 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 DM was very permissive. And he said, listen, just keep it all blanket, like, like level. Everybody is a 20 hit die creature or wizard or whatever it takes. He made a map and people started picking hexes on the map so that we had some distances and some geography. So you could start. And, and this is what goes back to the DM doesn't have to know what's going on. Um, you you could look at the map, find out who's near you and start talking to them and determining whether you're going to be friends or enemies or yeah. frenemies, which happened in a lot of cases. Yeah. So you can get up to all kinds of po- politics and skullduggery and the DM doesn't need to know that. He only needs to know what your plans are. When is your army March 4th? When do you send your spies out? You know, what do your spies learn? You know, and he'll, he has that information or he can tell the other player. And in a lot of cases, because I ran a spy master, I would just go to people and say, hey, look, I successfully spied on you. What can you tell me? What did I find? And in every case, the player went, yeah, OK, fine. No problem. Uh, actually, that's not true. In a couple of cases, my spies got caught. Yeah. And so they they and and this is another lesson we learned that, you know, if you're doing this online, the people who are the most entertaining on social media they're the ones that get interacted with. Mm-hmm. So if you have a killer concept, people are going to want to interact with that. The two most, the two, like three big factions wound up being, as I said, the young Pope in the like monster Vatican, <laughs> the, the mummy who was, whose theme was a, was a gangster rapper. He was called gangster rapper, like the play on words, rapper yeah, and rapping. And then the, the, Vampire had the classic Strahd von Zarovich backstory of his lost love who died because he was too busy focusing on the pursuit of immortality and he was pining for her, but his persona was the count from the Sesame Street. So was so, this the first Bro SR Muppet? Was, was I I think so? I, I know it was the first one that like it was definitely the one that proved the concept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know dan and it's the same guy that ran the burning sands dan is such a gifted writer that he was able to pull off that that contrast between the ridiculous and the sublime and people were like 
I'm totally in on that. A Muppet um, with pathos who can resist yeah, that. Yeah. It's, da- <laughs> it's the darndest thing. You know, you just wanted to give him a hug because he was so sad about, you know, Come the here, death of his... And, and of course, <laughs> the, 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 he, he'd post pictures of his love and it was like Morgan Fairchild or some, you know, smoking <laughs> hot. Like, and, and you could just see, well, anyway. Um, and, and he's and, and, and the DM in that case, Castuda said, look, I'm going to do this for a month. And it was a lot of work because we had like 30 guys and they were going in all kinds yeah. of different directions. But and at one point, he finally threw his hands up and went, you know what? OK, the mummies are attacking the the they are allied with the elf king and you're attacking the vampire who is backed up by the, the bark angel Michael. Let me know how it turns out, guys. You just back <laughs> yeah. way off. Yeah, and so the, it took like four or five days to run this epic battle of the city because it was just like all DMs back and forth, and and people were throwing memes up, and like one of the funniest parts of it was, um, so somebody said I, you know, I I wanted to somebody cast a sleep spell on the elves, um, the they they were hippogriff riding elves, and the player was like, ha, you forgot, elves are immune to sleep. And then the player that cast the spell went, I didn't forget that hippogriffs are not immune to sleep. <laughs> so all the elves died. Like the aerial core just immediately died because their mounts fell asleep. And the elves were like, oh, yeah, I forgot to pack a parachute. So you get elves. these weird, like, and who could yeah. you write that or predict that, you know, that kind of event would happen? That's the kind of so, spontaneous fun. And the receipts on that were all on Twitter, right? Like, I, I'm I'm very curious yes. about the original Brovenloft, but there's not, like, a session report that I can read. Like, I'd have to go here I, and there and patch it together. I, 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 so I, like I said, I played the Spy Master, and I had a really good idea about the people that I interacted with. Yeah. And which was, which was most of them, but, like, there were still plots and stuff running along. Like, some guy showed up, and he was Sam Hyde, but he was the Irish candy man, so he was, like, a serial killer. Oh, yeah. And um, I I had no idea what he was doing. I gotta be honest with you. Like like it, like <laughs> Sam Hyde's humor, uh, you know, full stop. I kind of get it, but and, and, you know, and there was he plays in Trilopolis, and like the Trilopolis mini game is him and I trying to crack each other up. So, <laughs> I, and that's and ultimately that's the other like key take home message yeah. is that the re one of the reasons this worked is is because it. It was an organic expression of the interests of all of the individual players. Right. If the DM had been say, had said no to everybody, um, if he had if the DM had prepared twelve different factions and then passed that out and said, "Who wants to play which one of these?" I don't think it would have worked. I think that people would have people would have been like, eh, eh. "Yeah, it's because- like doing someone else's PowerPoint." slides yeah exactly but and because it was the people throwing out the ideas that they were interested in um it it just it just worked and and like i said there's 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 a natural a b testing there's a positive reinforcement that happens that the guy that was running the mummy he was like his original plan was i'm just going to have him be like a stoner hanging out in his dungeon waiting for the pcs to show up but everybody kept asking him what can i do for you what can i do for you because he was so funny with the memes that he was like all right, I guess I have to do this. Like, I guess I better commit because, you know, people want to. Um, and and so, you know, we we kind of bullied him into being more active than he might otherwise have been. So there were PCs, like there were there were players running around all this crazy going on? The uh, poster on Twitter, he goes by BW1776, is a huge fan of the TV show Twin Peaks. And he said, you know what? Twin Peaks is there. This hex is Twin Peaks. And uh, the DM was like, all right, why not? I mean, we got a puppet. We got a, a rapping mummy. What? Why not? <laughs> Fine. So before, and this was supposed to be, it kicks off on October 1. A week beforehand, people were saying, well, I'm going to, how do I get to Brovenloft? And the guy running, and, and the guy that put Twin Peaks in there said, uh, you know what? You can take the red room. I don't know what that is, but it's like a, teleporting thing so you got okay. pcs showing up and they're like hey uh and they're talking to a couple of, and again i don't know all the characters but they're talking to one of the guys i think spoiler alert there's like a demon that runs the town or something and he so he gave the pcs broncos ford broncos yeah that actually said, made it into my rap song yeah, yeah yeah so they 
That, that's right. Um, which is hilarious, by the way. Those of you that haven't seen it, go watch. It's good to be a bro. Uh, so, th and this was before October even started that we already had guys driving around in Broncos going three or four hexes over. They explored an old broken down mill. They ran into a bunch of zombie uh, Yankee soldiers. And because these guys are all like, they live south of the Mason Dixon line. Yeah. I mean, it's like red meat to the sharks, man, throwing chum saying you can kill zombie Yankees without any guilt. <laughs> they loved it. Um, and again, it was one of like three plot hooks that the DM threw out, and that was the one the players gravitated to. So that's what we're doing this week. Right on. Uh, so there were, in fact, there was one guy, he he used like a mad scientist thing, and he basically, he would post on Twitter. He would say, look, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. I will pay you guys. And I worked with him as the spy master to set up an ambush to get him a, a couple of uh, Ford Broncos. I, I arranged for this player to take a couple of Ford Broncos over there. And we arranged like a false, like we left a, it was, it was the elves. We, we framed them for it. Um, but that all happened like in a table session. So you had table sessions going on. And like, even now, if you wanted to go to Brovenloft, you could ask the guys, Hey, what's up? Um, the guy that runs the mummy, I think he lost the battle, but there's like a, a highway of light where he had all of his priests cast continual light on zombies and then march on the Vatican. And they all got killed along the highways. So then they rotted and were like, all right, dead I, I always got, yeah, now the highways got like. <laughs> That's the, the kind of stuff a DM is just down. not going to make up. That is the emergent craziness that comes out yeah. of this kind of play. And, um, and it becomes persistent because it's it's catchy and it sticks in your head and, and it, it has a, a real game effect. To Paul's yeah, for sure. question in the chat, do you yes. feel like the patrons outshine the players, like that they're having more fun than the actual PCs? This goes back to, well, bear in mind, some of the guys running patrons were running PCs over uh, here are running patrons over there. Yeah, yeah. Like <clears throat> like we, we don't stick to just one character. Like if our characters are busy doing something over there, the patron can still be active. That yeah. happens a lot. And, and people think, well, well, why won't you use that information for your PCs? It's like, we, you understand these are called role playing games for a reason. Yeah. When I play a paladin, I play that role. When I play a patron, I play that role. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what we do. It's, it's, it, it's fine. You can, you can, see the campaign through two sets of eyes and you know what people do this is like call of cthulhu people do this all the time um hey there's a spell book and you know if if you if you the ritual is to put blood on it and then wine and then speak this word i'm i've played in call of cthulhu games where i went oops i spilled my wine i cut i dropped the glass and cut myself and then i said the the swear word uh you know the word that i was reading and oh i cast the spell accidentally Oops. Well, Oopsie. like my player, my character didn't know, but I did. So I did the interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing happens here where, you know, you've, you're working at cross purposes to your patron, but that's all right. Like I know my patron's going to do this and you know, you, you just learn to like, you root for it's we're both Michigan bros. Right on. I like Michigan. I graduated from Oklahoma. If Michigan plays Oklahoma, I root for whoever's on offense. Yeah. <laughs> right. right I just want to see yeah. a high score and then whoever wins, I'm happy. And it's the same thing with this. If you've ever been like laughed at the death of a character that was ridiculous, like you saw it come and you took the high risk, it didn't pay off. Then you understand that it's OK that one of your sides is going to lose because yeah. the journey is so interesting when you do that. Well, I'm hoping to get him on the show, but I was actually there when I when a guy had two characters present and he used one character to assassinate the other. It was amazing. <laughs> he killed one because he was playing the one and yeah. they came to odds and he backstabbed him on his, while he was running away. He backstabbed his own guy and killed him. Yep. It was amazing. And we're going to share that story later. Um, but let's, let's catch it up to, to current. Well, let's, so let's bring up Paul Dolby D Dolby's comment there. One issue with patron play is that there has not been much of an attempt to actually codify it. Cause that brings us to December, nope. which was it's uh, at 10 Oh six. Oh man. I'm way behind on the chat. Oh, that, you're all good. Man. Okay. <laughs> so this was my, do you want to bring up the, the map of December? Yes. Okay, so so what you're looking at on screen now is one of the memes I made. 
And I said, well, let's let's try that. Let's maybe the problem is it's too free form. I'm a hex encounter war gamer. I'm a, I'm a I'm a I'm a gaming whore, right? You put a game in front of me, I'm down. Let, let's do this, baby. Hey, it's um, not just you. You are the reason why I got Xenos Rampant for Christmas last year. So oh, such, such a good game, isn't it? So I said, let's try to codify this. And I used my extensive expertise to create a little hex encounter war game. And I said, who's up? And I, I opened it up to 12 people. And again, it was one of those cases where we were kind of spitballing. And I said, you know what you could do if you wanted to run a patron game is just build a grassland and orcs are perfect for this because we know their personality. Mm -hmm. Just have, find 12 guys, give them each the, the AD and D roster, the, the, the monster manual and have them roll you get 40 to 400 orcs and then build like like gary tells you the whole structure of an orc clan you got 12 orcs throw them on a map give them a couple of things to fight over let them go free now a smart man would have stopped there <laughs> but i said well i but you know i i don't want to have to adjudicate all of this stuff so i'm gonna write a simple like hex and base and i'm gonna give them some some things so there's there's a human city that you can go raid and I'm going to like build a little backstory with the dark Lord that says you have to, we're going to do the December. If you can bring me the most slaves in gold by December. Yeah. So I said, the natural enemies are dwarves, elves, humans, and you know, goblins are kind of the slaves. So you can raid goblin town. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I got these simple rules and I used, I still used AD and D as the like, boilerplate like mm -hmm. we, we all know what one hit die is yeah. so that's kind of the default we all know what a gold piece is we all know you know it's grassland so it should be easy but what i didn't count on is some high level play by some of the players because one of the players that signed up said okay i want to take over goblin town how do i do that but i was like uh i don't know let's build a little mini game <laughs> So I went to AD and D and I said, all right, well, you, you, how are you going to do it? And he said, well, I got my shaman and I've got my like bodyguard. So I'm going to break in, I'm going to kill the leader and I'm going to declare myself King and take over all the goblins. Uh, this was the guy that plays Macho Mandoff, right? Marcus this is Orcus. the guy that plays he, and he ran Porcus Orcus in this case. He is one of the most elite people I've ever played with. Like the way oh. his mind works is amazing. Yeah, he doesn't waste any time. And he sees what the objective is. And he says, you know, he, and what I like about him is he, he's willing to take high risk, high reward actions. Yeah. And this was one of those. And so I said, look, well, here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to use the assassination table from the DMG and I'm going to roll. And, you know, we're going to play this out. So so he was able to successfully assassinate the Goblin King. But... <laughs> When the sub chiefs, he did it in front of the Goblin King sub chiefs, and so I and we're doing this kind of real time where I said, okay, I um, now I need to see how they react to that, and they reacted with a little bit of uncertainty, you know, and and I so said, you used so a reaction table and got like a middle roll. I got exactly like a neutral roll, um, and I said, you know, make your case. So then he did. We did a little light role playing and. And I said, okay, now here's the second roll. And he did a good job. So I gave him a bonus and it was still terrible. <laughs> and so this is where you, you know, you think what would happen there is that it's not like the, the sub chiefs are static players in their own right. They want to be Goblin King too. So they attacked him. They killed the shaman. It actually cost him, you know, in the long run, but he was able to escape. And, um, you know, but, but the funny thing is he 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 lost out. So he was the goblin. If he wanted to, he was a goblin friend. He could have gone and just recruited slaves for free once a week. But he um, wanted the whole city. <laughs> but he wanted the whole city right out of the gate. And because it failed, he lost his shaman and he lost the goblin friend. He couldn't do that anymore. He was like, okay, fine. We're just going to war. Uh, but he also was like, well, how do I take over the, the, the home? Like, I don't like my home base. I want to take over the home base of one of the other players. And I hadn't thought that that was possible. So this is where you you get that like kind of hybrid of a standard war game with more of a role playing game and yeah. and it worked great. We had a great time for the month. Um, I was thinking weekly turns and and but the codifying didn't work because there were so many little complexities like that because there were situations where I mean I expected armies to intersect on a map and we'd have to run a fight. Um, 
but you know, I was still trying to do this game in essentially real time. Yeah. Give me your week's orders. So it wasn't I'll... quite one to one, but it was like week to week. Yeah. 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 Um, and and then I, you know, you give me the orders by Sunday, and then I have like, I'll, I'll just got to figure out Monday what happens on Monday, and Tuesday and and Wednesday, and I would publish on the blog what the results were for each day's turn, one per day. Yeah. And that gave me time to go, okay, well, you know, on Thursday, that's when these two armies meet. So, I, I, you know, I can ask these guys, you're going to meet this guy on Thursday. What's your reaction? Do you attack him? Or Because I don't know what the allies are at this point, right? Yeah. You see these guys in the distance. Do you attack? Do you run? Do you parlay? What are you going to do? And, um, you know, so that gave us a little bit of time that I was basically adjudicating three or four days ahead of time through most of the month. But it was too much work. It was just too much to hang on to. Well, um, see, that's that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this, because it seems to me like the last the last person I talked to you about this style of play was the curator who ran mm -hmm. Oriental Adventures. And that that just seemed like it was absolutely overwhelming. And how many um, players did he have? He had 67 players. <clears throat> and 30 okay. of them were patrons. And right. Yeah. So it went nuts for him. Um, this seemed like a way more organized attempt like i know with with uh trilopulus jeffro just switched everything on at once and put in a ton sounds like um for brovenloft it was another kind of like everyone just started doing a land grab and you had a bunch of people piling in what did you take from your experiences as a player in brovenloft and like how did that inform some of the decisions you made where you're like okay 12 people here's the map because it seems like you went into it way more in control than a lot of the ones that I've seen. And it sounds like it still got way over out of, out of control with the communication with the DM. And that's really kind of the tension where you're looking for the sweet spot. Yeah. Um, how much control can the DM, like, like how, how much line can you play out? And, and really part of that, like, like access is part of my thinking was, trying to find an easy way uh to to manage the asymmetric knowledge like yeah um and we call it fog of war um when you don't know where the armies are going and or where they're at and whether you're sending scouts out and the the ability to gather knowledge that your opponent doesn't have is a superpower mm. um and so that's really the the, the like like the real struggle there is that the more you want to engage fog of war, the more time demands you put on the referee. Yeah. And so that's where we're still kind of, of trying to figure out the easiest way to manage that. And, and ultimately it may just come down to a matter of taste. How, how bad, how much control do you as the, as the DM want over the game? Mm. Um, you know, how much mystery do you want as a player? Uh, and, you know, how do you share information in a way that you're only sharing relevant information as it becomes relevant? And how do you even know if it's relevant? Yeah. Was you know, that's kind of the, the struggle. Was 12, was 12 patrons too much? I, 12 patrons would have been manageable um, if... Uh, hmm, I, I think a 12 is probably a really good, good number, but, but again, you know, you're, you're, I, the question is, what are you trying to get out of this? Yeah. And, and I was trying to run a hex and counter war game, which with two, 12 is probably too many. We could probably could have done with eight and it would have reduced the workload considerably. And you had no PCs, no table play. Yours was strict patron play. I did not. And and that was one of the things that that this experiment proved that that this is not the right vehicle for generating um D, &D adventures on the fly. Mm -hmm. I had hoped that because I was using the D, D rules that there would be some possibility for uh groups to engage, but the difficulty is that a DM whose players say, I want to go to these orc lands he doesn't have any information about what's going on where yeah you know i did and i would have been happy to share that information but there was really no way for a 
table, a PC table playing D&D to influence the results of this campaign. And that was one of the failures that, you know, if, if we had to do it over again, that would be one of the key holes that needed to be filled. So, but if you had players, that might have changed the way that the patrons played, right? Like that whole dichotomy of like, am I here to try to gather the attention of the party and offer them hooks that gives me more chance to interact with them? Or am I here to crush my enemies? A hundred percent. There's two different ways you can do that. Um, and they might be at odds. Yep. Well, and I, uh, you know, maybe the theme is wrong too. Uh, you know, unless you're running an evil party, unless you see a, a juicy target. Yeah. Um, you know, what is there for there's is what's the upside of taking my PC into this area um, versus the the, the risk? <laughs> yeah. What's the upside versus yeah. the risk? Yeah, there's a lot of danger going into the rise of the Orc yeah. PC. Yeah, because they're just like, hey, more slaves and gold for the Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did think this would be an interesting model for, and this is probably a horrible idea, and I don't want to burn out like everyone else I've talked to, but like. What if Keep on the Borderlands had the same conceit as this game, where like the um, I think the the biggest dungeon in there, the, or the most dangerous one, is is like the necromancers and stuff. What if the reason there's so many different uh, species in the Caves of Chaos is like they're holding auditions, and whichever one um, wins their favor can march on the Keep, right? Is that kind of what you were thinking mm -hmm. with Malturum? Um, this here we've got hexes where people are spread way out yeah so that's another question i have about this style of game is like how much space is good because i've heard of some where they tried to get it going but everyone was so far away they just did their own thing Th that was the original trollopolis issue was yeah. with 30 mile hexes that uh, you know it could take you a week and a half to get to <laughs> one of the other patrons to even be able to talk to them and and the guy that was the furthest out, he was the caveman, United Caveman Federation. When it came time to pick which dinosaur he had as his like minions, he chose the Ankylosaurus, which is the slowest dinosaur. <laughs> so what do you do with right. that? I guess also you wait for people to come to you. Had the strongest meme game though, right? Like it, yeah, exactly. And that led yeah. to a whole bunch of other stuff, which you adjudicated a multi-table cosmic war. Right, uh, which led into Brovenloft, but when you decided to do Decembork, you said this is not connected to any of that crazy. This is its own thing. So well, we, we've actually talked about where this is in respect to Trollopolis, but I don't think it ever like got like like became canon mm -hmm. because there wasn't a whole lot to interact with here. And you know, the the Dark Lord, the the story is the Dark Lord was preparing his crusade, and he sacked the the orcs already sacked the city that's on the left hand side of the map. And I get, he marched off and did something, but you know, the, it, 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 nobody really seemed keen on on entering it, and so I just you know let it go. I'm not going to develop it if nobody's going in. Yeah. So, um, but but I think the the like this, I I don't know that this is the right way to approach it. I think that well, let's back up and talk about what I'm doing on the channel right now. Um, okay. I'm, I'm playing solo AD and D. And I'm kind of working from the ground up and seeing how we get to the patron play from level one. And at the, the one who played Porcus Orcus, we've talked about him a couple of times already. He essentially did this with Macho Mandolf. Yeah. Um, you know, he built Macho Mandolf up to a very powerful um, patron. He was, he was a magic user. He was a swolcerer, if memory serves. And he had the resources to start hiring parties and sending them out to do things like he became there was a period of about four months where we thought, you know, Mandolf won. I, I don't know what we do except start a new campaign because nobody can threaten him. You know, he can deal with any threat that we throw at him unless the DM does some kind of dumb, you know, rocks fall, everybody dies thing. Um, <laughs> and and there was a lot of talk in the back channels about the Mandolf problem. Um, but. Ultimately, what we realized is that he can't be everywhere at once and his forces can't be everywhere at once. So if you if you have enough, you know, irons in the fire, he can't deal with it all. And you can kind of escape from his his influence that way. But the other issue is that he that that player recognized the issue and he started going off and doing his own cosmic stuff and got yeah. himself into trouble. And at one point, Macho Mandolf was um, captured by. I think it was Loth. 
Loth, the, the spider goddess. Yeah, yeah. And there was a table, and he said, "Hey guys, I'm in trouble." And um, you know, I he sent out like psych, psychic missives, and a there was a tabletop cam the uh, session where they went and they rescued him, and you know, so he rewarded them appropriately. But I I think as as a D and D player, I that may be the smarter way to look at patron play. Hmm. Is I, I, there may be too much focus on the top down. Let's start with the patrons and, and give them resources and go for yeah. it. I think it has to develop organically. As we said, if you're running a campaign and you're, you've got a patron that shows up at some point, a player says, Hey, are there any high level wizards in the area? And you say, yeah, there is, um, you know, you want to go talk to them. We'll, we'll, you know, it'll take you till next week. And you know, the, the, the classic DM advice, let's uh it's gonna take you a week you know because i need a week to prepare the character yeah and that's where you say um you know okay you're gonna go to the wizard we'll figure it out next week and then you call one of the players the next day and say hey can you like tell me what that wizard's all about and what his deal is and just you know whip some stuff up for me uh you know don't be don't be afraid to it, bring in other players or, or now that you're online, you know, <laughs> ask Dunder Moose. He's got all the time in the world. He'd love to design a faction for you. I'm sure, you know, hit me up. I, I could, um, I, I, I actually, I can't talk about it a whole lot cause it's, it's still kind of in the background, but I am participating in a campaign right now as a patron and it, it's the, 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 the guy who's running the campaign, he had a faction and he said, look, here's the leader. And here's kind of just like a sketchy outline of what he's like. And what are you going to do? And I said, you know, and, and there was one little word that I keyed in on. And I said, I want to lean into that keyword. Yeah. And this is not it, but we'll just say it's, um, um, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, a whole, uh, what would you say? Um, insects. He's the Lord of insects. And I totally misread the situation, but, you know, um, the DM went with it. He was like, okay, that's not where I was going with it, but okay. And so I'm, and, and ultimately, like I, all the orders I give are, I want to send my, you know, I, I want to send a squad of guys over to investigate that hex. I don't know what this is. And then two weeks later, he sends me a, a message on Twitter and he says, okay, your guys came back and reported that it's a, a black tower. What do you want to do now? And I say, well, I'm going to try to hire some PCs to go investigate the Black Tower for me. I don't want to risk my resources. I'd rather pay yeah. for it. Right. <laughs> so so and, and then that's it. And then two weeks later, I'll come back and he'll say, OK, nobody bought. What do you want to do? And I say, OK, I'll send spies out to this city to find out what they're up to, because I don't have enough information right now. Um, but it can be as simple as that. Yeah. Well, or it can be as simple wrong. as you you get if, if you get the one big loot haul, I've got 10,000 gold. I'm going to start a war band what's um the guy uh it's spelled augma but it's 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 those weird celtic words so i think it's pronounced wima wima he's i think he's playing in a campaign with with a fella named crossface killa mm -hmm. who's one of those like ufc bros that that's a good guy up. yeah yeah and like they hit level two and they said i need i need 40 bros like they were supposed to be like operating out of a town and they were like, no, nah, why don't we just take it over? I got the money. I'm hiring 50 guys and I'm going to, my gang's going to just take over. So like already at second level, they're engaged in a style of patron game. Yeah. And that may be like, as we keep finding that may be the key that unlocks this is that you can't force it. You have to let it come to you. Yeah. And I think, I feel like maybe that's what, what we tried to do is said, hey, how long does it take in first edition to get to name level? We don't want to wait that long. Let's just yeah. throw our guys yeah. in. And then you get patrons that don't know the game, don't understand what it's built on, the rules and that kind of stuff. And uh, then they're leaning more and more on the DM, which will cause that burnout. And the DM is like, hey, I was promised this was going to make my game easier. Right. And now I'm holding all these hands. I've got, like, how, how much of your day during December, like, how many... How, how many, even though you had kept it to one week, how much communication, how much of your day did you spend running Disembark during the holiday season? <laughs> it, it was, so I was fortunate. I was working like the, the, the graveyard shift mm -hmm. and I had a, like a three or four hour block of time at, during the middle of my shift 
that there was nothing going on. Um, yeah. We were, I was almost literally in a bunker. Just, I couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't do anything. So I had three or four hours and I was probably spending a good 12 hours a week. Like it was like adjudicating the week's orders would take about eight hours. Oh my gosh. Add another four or five hours just for like the communications. And of course you have that communications gap that you have to deal with where, okay, X happened. What do you do? And the guy's in Australia. So I have to wait until like the next morning to get his answer. And then I say, okay, why happened? Now what do you do? And I have to wait 12 hours because now he's sleeping. Yeah. Um, And that's one of the challenges that if you're, if you're doing patron play with a table that you game with during the week, see, this is, this is the other nice thing is um, players generally don't have much to do with the game during, during the week when, when you're not sitting at the table, that all falls on the DM. And if you do, if the DM does turn managing that orc tribe, Hey, orc, here's the map. Where are you building your fort? Right. It's going to take a month. Okay. Now we have a scenario. Now we have a situation that's developed. Just give me the roster in case the players decide to go there and tell me the basics of what they're like. And what's really weird is I think like the other key is that you can't like, you have to step back and this happens with one-to-one time too, when you're running the multiple, like we talked about running multiple players, you have to be willing to step back and stop viewing the campaign as the the stage on which your one character plays his part, mm. but start looking at the entire campaign as a toy that you're all playing with together. That's right. When we were little yeah. kids, we would play Legos, and the whole Lego town was our toy. Mm-hmm. And you know, we would march our little right. <clears throat> but, it and, changes your approach. It does. And so um you, you'll even find yourself like if you're sitting at a table with a DM and the DM's not going to tell you what the Orc Warlord's plan is. Why would the player do that? If the player is running that patron, we've had that before. You know, you have that already going on in games where we split the party and, and player X knows one thing and we really need to know that thing. But player X says, you know, but that character is not with us right now. And the, and the player says, I can't tell you. Like the person who's here now, the character that's here now doesn't have the information. So I can't tell you that. We can't act on it, right? We do that all the time. Why would it be any different when you're running a patron on the side versus over here? Yeah. And so the player that's running the warlord, he builds the personality. And if and if it's interesting, the, the, the party gets involved with that warlord. And so I think really the, the way to do this is not is is just to slowly kind of build up to it and you know if if the orc warlord isn't interesting and he doesn't have a successful mission and he just kind of fades into the background that's all right you know there'll be other patrons that arise yeah so keeping up with the chat here um yes do you think that the bro sr online has oversold uh the magic of the bronstein uh, at one point, I referred to it as a Bronkenstein, right? It's like, <laughs> yes. we're trying to breathe life into this thing. It may be a misshapen reanimation, and it seems like it can, the Bronkenstein can go out of control and hurt players, kick them out of the game, and they've got bad feelings, burn out DMs, and they're like, I'm done. I'll, I'll see you guys in two months. <laughs> you know, like, do you think part of that is because we made it sound like, Hey, this will solve problems, and really, it creates new ones. No, one hundred percent, absolutely not. All right. Um, the 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 Bro SR uh, has never been shy about our failures, and has never been shy about how our failures make us stronger. D- and and even our failures are far more interesting than most campaign successes. And that's going to be true at your table as much as it is ours. The the campaigns that, well, the campaigns that fail spectacularly will be remembered forever. Yep, right. we went after a red dragon before we were ready and we got TPK. That's far more interesting than, you know, the red dragon was boring and we just stopped showing up to, to Dunder's house on Friday nights because we had better <laughs> things to do. 
I would much rather see a you know an experimental rocket blow up on the launch pad than see the weird billionaire just quietly walk away and fund you know weird little <laughs> political causes. Right. Um, the 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 other thing I'll point out is that. A lot of people are intrigued by this. A lot of people are sold on the idea. Even if we haven't found our path to the mountain yet, we're exploring new ways to play this game. And that's something that that there's not a lot of, I, you know, aside from like the rainbow haired crowd that's experimenting with pronouns and clerics in wheelchairs, mm -hmm. bro, bro, you just, just get healed. You, it, it's a spell right there. I don't, what's what's the most interesting thing rules wise that's going on right now another reskin of basic expert advanced you know D, &D. i i don't know what else people are doing that's that's as interesting as this i there's something to be said like i enjoy my time at the table and maybe i'm weird for this but i feel like the best thing as a player that i can walk away with is a story that i can tell my friends about what happened that makes them go, oh, man, I wish that my game was like that. I wish the crazy kind of stuff you're talking about happened at my table. And, you know, for for whatever else is going on here, Bro SR style play consistently delivers that for me. Um, <clears throat> that's just been my experience. Well, we've been largely focused on patron play, right, t today. And I, I think that p part of the issue is that there's and there's a lot of new ideas that have come out of this experimentation with the old ways of playing the game. Yeah. And you know, if you like I patron play might be the least interesting of them. Like it, the 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 idea of leading massive armies is interesting and cosmic battles is interesting, but I you know, one of the one of the lessons that I've taken away from my experiences playing low level solo AD and D is that th there's adventure to be found in the nitty gritty details of first level play. Yeah. Um, and that uh, like we already said, I mean, th that's the punchline is you have to build it yourself. You have, you got to get away from the splat book treadmill and you have to, do the a b testing at your table what level of commitment are you comfortable with hmm. are you okay with running a full nation some guys love doing that i i think it would be fun that's one of the ways macho mandolf won at D, &D. he took the the domain the, the the rules for running a domain how many silver pieces a day do i get you know mm -hmm. what is all of that and he just kind of ran with it and did it on his own and because he was willing to play that game and put in the time his stuff grew and the more you engage with this stuff, the more, you know, it's, it's like, it's like lottery tickets. The yeah. only way you win those moments at the table is by sitting down and doing the time and buying the tickets. You're not going to get those memories if you're not using the game, if you're not playing the game. And, you know, the, one of the issues with patron play that we've glossed over is how important one-to-one -one time is. We talked a little bit about balance. How do you balance these guys? And ultimately, when you're playing a game where anything goes, where the only limit is your imagination, the only thing that you have that acts as a leveling agent is time. Yeah. Every one of us has 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. That's all. And, and no matter what you do, if you're using the present calendar as your game calendar, then you'll have situations where a guy says, you know what? I have enough money to build a castle. whoop de freaking do It's going to take you three years to build that castle, <laughs> minimum. And yeah. you know what I can do to your, to your construction site in those three years? That is an opportunity for an adventure. Like people talk about all of the problems that are involved with, well, that would mean that someone would do X. And I think mm -hmm. that's an adventure. You're yeah. absolutely right. Someone might do that. Well, I have a gold mine. Well, what if someone breaks into my gold mine? Why don't they? Why wouldn't they just steal it? Okay. Well, what? What? Get, follow it. Keep going. What yeah. if they would steal your money? How would you stop them? Well, I would just buy guards. So do it. 
Yeah. Oh, well, well, what if they buy my guards off? How do you prevent it? You know, that, but, but that means, but that means, but that there's that chain of, but then that means that's interesting stuff. It's Lean not a bug. That. It's a feature, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The, the, the number one, but that means that I get is, well, you know, what if you're halfway through the delve and everyone has to go home for the night? And, um, the, the obvious answer that we give over and over and again is you take get your stuff and you get back to town because you're not going to leave somebody in the dungeon overnight and i don't know why people have a hard time like that solved problems for me because that right. means next thursday when we play if so and so can't make it that doesn't matter their guy just won't go on the delve it's not like we have to puppet his character through because we paused and like now we've got an empty player character right like it's Right. It solves a problem. It doesn't create right. one. Well, uh, because I part of the issue that the Bro SR hammers is, and and I found this to be the case with with m most of my YouTube stuff is people don't want to change what they're doing. They want validation for what they're doing. Yeah. And when you tell them if you want different results, you have to take different actions. If you're not getting what you want out of the game, you need to play a different game. They that bothers people a lot, particularly the kind of guys who think of themselves as good at D&D. &D. And, you know, they still mouth the same old platitudes that people have said for 40 years. Yeah. Well, you know, the most important thing is that we have fun. Well, that's <laughs> fun is an emergent property that doesn't yeah. that doesn't mean anything like it sounds good. But what do you what if what I think is fun is playing AD&D? &D? And this happens a lot, too. I need help with game X. Well, you could always play game Y. That doesn't help. Yeah. So we, that's part of the problem as well. And that's part of, and, and when people engage in that, that that's where the bro SR has earned a reputation as being mean spirited. Because yes. when you say that we counter punch and you're not supposed to do that. You're, you're not, you're supposed to validate me. No, I'm not here to validate you. I don't well, want you to feel good about and me. respond very badly from that. Yeah. Well, and then there's it, others that like take the moment to say, well, maybe there's something here. I, I liken it to like those old Kung Fu movies where the guy wants to train at the uh, esoteric monastery and he, mm -hmm. he knocks on the door and they open it and they're like, go away. And then they shut the door. And then like either he goes away and never trains or he like sits down on the step and 24 hours later, they're like, all right, come on in, we'll train you. Right. <laughs> right. That like, like, how do you weather the initial <laughs> swarm of negativity that can happen if you say something incorrect on Twitter? How do you yeah. punch through that to get to the good stuff that the Broasar is playing with and discovering? Because there is there is a whole attitude that will shut people off and they won't even give it a chance because they're looking for that validation, probably um recognition rather than like okay, these guys are a little bit abrasive, um, but I'm going to, you know, iron sharpens iron. We're going to thump each other around and then I'm going to see what they're all about. Well, that's, there's also a look, if, if you're happy doing what you're doing, why are you here? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. You don't need my, my valid. You don't need me to my stamp of approval. That, like literally there's the entire rest of the hobby that's willing to tell you the, the style of, of game that you're playing is fine. They're, they're, go, go ahead. We're, that's fine. Yeah. We're, we're good. You know, it's, it's, I don't know. It, 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 let's keep it positive tonight, shall we? Right on. Let's do it. Uh, there's enough negativity in the world. Uh, the, it, it, and ultimately, that's what it comes down to. If you're happy with the game you're playing, keep playing it. You don't, you don't need any of this advice. You know, if, if you need the validation, yeah, I, the one thing I would take is if you need the validation from outside, like if you need everyone to tell you how special you are, if you're not getting it, if you're not being validated by the play that you have. Yeah. That might be a problem. You, you spend some time thinking about that. What am I not getting out of the game that I need approval from outside places? Yeah. Like ultimately the professor doesn't really care, you know, whether you approve or not, we're having too much fun. To, to worry about it but they are and, also making my game better yeah I, that's it's clear yeah. that i have a good experience and want to heighten it and we've had people come into to, to threads and say you know what I've, I've looked at this i've tried it and and i see the value but i really like this other style better mm -hmm. and 
you know, our, one of our big things is if that's the case, like I have enough experience that I can say, you know, you should really probably be playing dungeon world. Like there's a lot of people that want, they want to be part of the D and D community, but the game that they really want to play is dungeon world. And it's like, they, you should go play that game. It's a great game. It does exactly what you're looking for mm -hmm. without like all of the bending over backwards and post hoc rationalizations for, well, but uh, you know you, the rules can be whatever you want them to be. Well, yeah, I know the rules for chess can be whatever you want them to be too. But if yeah, you know, if you and I are going to have a conversation about chess, we have to talk about the same set of rules. And you know, if I want to go down to the, the the Central Park in New York City and play chess, I can't use rule zero, and I can't talk about chess strategies if I'm using a different set of rules. There's a reason yeah. that you have to be very careful when you talk about football. Are you talking Australian rules, Canadian rules, American rules? You have to specify that. Yeah. And for some reason in D&D, &D, people are like, well, we're just talking about D&D, &D, so it doesn't really matter. I'm like, no, it absolutely does. I well, can't talk to playing, fifth edition players. Yeah, when you're playing a game there, you have to extend trust to your patrons or your players that, that they know what they're doing and that sure. they're doing it in a way that's fair for everybody. Like, that becomes a lot more important. Yeah, right, well, about that. Let's get back well, to but, it, but again, the, the conditional is important. If you want to run a game with 30 to 50 players where you're <laughs> commanding armies, then this is what you have to do. You're not going to get that experience by playing fifth edition D&D in the conventional style. And if you don't want that, if you want a single cast of five characters and mm -hmm. you only meet once every six weeks because, you know, Joe's got a doctor. That's all we can get together for four hours. And we're willing to take five years to run through Horde of the Dragon Queen. Fifth yeah. edition is there for you. It works great. Go with our blessings. But if you want what we were promised as 10 year olds, 50 players always on, you know, first level parties messing up a dungeon for the 20th level wizard yeah. that's run by another guy, this is the way you have to do it. That's These right. are the practices you have to engage in. All right. So let's get back to the advice stuff. Um, what makes a good player in a patron style Frankenstein? Uh, the, well, again, you know, we, we, we need to define our terms. Um, it, it, they have to be engaged enough. Oh, boy, man. Mm, you're really holding like, my feet to the fire here. Yeah, I feel like, well, so you've got experience playing in them and you've got experience yeah. running them. Um, and when you're running it, is there a certain style of play that a player can do that make that like makes you like, man, I'm glad this person's in here, as opposed to one that makes it harder? As a so let let's just kind of establish the style we're looking at here. Yeah, uh, you, you're uh, Mr. Moose here is running a weekly campaign, and he's got a um, I don't know. You 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 tell me what's one of the factions in your campaign. Um, uh, it, you just make one of leprechauns. There's, we've got a, a tribe of leprechauns. Okay, great. So, Wait, are you are, are we being hypothetical? Or are you asking me about the actual games I play? <laughs> you come to me and you say, I need you to run these leprechauns. Okay, okay. So, what, what do I need to do as, as a player? Uh, well, first of all, I should look up the stats for leprechauns, I should see what my resources are, yeah. and I should have the creativity to come up with an interesting and engaging idea. And the, the, the hurdle that we have to get over is I have to know who are the other players in the game, like who are the other patrons that I can interact with. Mm -hmm. And if, if you already have a goal for these guys, that's ideal. Hey, you, I, we need the leprechauns want X. How would you go after X? Right. Is that and something then, the DM supplies where you're like, okay, you got the leprechauns. Here's what they want. Or is that something that you're like, what do the leprechauns want in the player supplies? Or is it both? You, you should you should have the goal in mind to begin with. Okay. Right. Going back to Axis and Allies, you want to take territory. Right. right. That's they like there should be a goal there. Now, the player can decide through play, you know what? That's not my goal anymore. Those jerks betrayed me. They stole my lucky charms. I'm going after my lucky charms. I gotta find them. And that means I need to, you know, I need to work with. The, the pixies over here or the sprites or whoever, um, you know, the, the goal can change over time, but yeah. it, at least at the beginning, it helps the player understand, like we all know what the players, the, the PC's goal is get gold stack bills, right? Yeah. 
get they experience. Wanna, they want to pay for training and level up. Exactly. And so it helps as a player to have a goal out of the starting gate. And then as your plans either work or don't work, you can move on to other goals. The same as players do, right? Like you start out, I just want to get gold. And then that dragon to eat my brother, I want to kill that dragon which means I need to get enough gold to hire an army to help me beat the dragon kind of thing. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, that, I think that goal helps. That would be the, the, the two big things that I would recommend is, you know, players willing to engage with the rules of the patron, right. And at least willing to look it up and create that engaging idea and is willing to accept that goal, at least initially. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as contact is concerned, it's always on. So you, you know, you give clear and concise instructions. Okay. I need information from X, you know, how, and this is where some of the back and forth comes in. Then I would come to you, Dunder, and I would say, how would I go about, you know, securing the, you know, I want this, this person to do that. How would I do that? And you have that same conversation that you have with a regular PC. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I, I want to. I want to swim across the river. I need to get across the river. How do you do it? Is is my rope long enough? No, it's not long enough. Okay. Well, can I build a raft? Well, it's too swift for that. Well, can I, you know, you have that same conversation yeah. during downtime and you can just, you know, and if it, and again, if, if it doesn't matter, you get across the river and hey, you cross the river, it takes 10 minutes. We don't have to be, mm -hmm. have a big conversation, yeah. but if it really matters, well, wait a second, you're talking to that person. Just go talk to them. You know, see, see what the experience is. Yeah. All right. And then the accountability part for the DM to say, all right, you're because looks like from what you did, I've got, you know, if you look at the screen here, I've got you, mm -hmm. you had a draft yep. and you're like, everybody tell me where you want to be. Everybody tell me what your special powers are. And then um, there were, a, you did a lot of upfront work to kind of give them some guide rails on where they were going to be and make it fair. Yeah. So, so the idea is that, and it's the same with any game, you know, with Dungeons and Dragons, you can do anything you want, but you can't do everything you want. <laughs> right. And, and that's what the draft was all about was which is more important to you with the, the right location or the right power. Do you want the most troops or do you want the most starting gold? You know, you can have one of those, but then the other one is going to have to take a back seat. So rather than telling people you can do whatever you want, I just said, here's your options, you know, pick and choose. And so if you're building a top down, I think this is yeah. a useful way to do that. But I don't think this would really apply to like most tabletop RPGs. So one of the ideas that, um, that I came across in, uh, okay, Macho says uh, draft was great, exciting to participate in. Um, one of the things that because so I started playing Trilopolis after all of the crazy had kind of gone on and you know we had we had switched off some of the big uh patrons and it was it was starting back down at the small level and so it was kind of like a depth change right because I was like expecting all of the spectacle that I saw on Twitter and then it was like uh no the sun has been turned off everything's freezing and you're starting <laughs> in a tiny town right right um and there were like several sessions where it didn't seem that much was happening right but um it, there's this like i forget what jeffro calls it like the point of convergence or the emergence or something there comes a session where all the weird little stuff that didn't make sense or was boring all of a sudden hooks together and creates just amazing play and um so i'm wondering if the best use of this patron style thing is not necessarily an ongoing always on thing but like you have your players and then when the dm needs something to throw the world off equilibrium he can bring in a few people playing the, the powerful npcs and have them start to start the crazy wheel starting and then you just do it for a time and then when you, you're done, now it's the player's job to try and reassert equilibrium in the world. It generates all the hooks for you. Like, that seems like the style that makes it easier for the GM as opposed to making it arduous. I, I think so. And I think that's where that, that may be part of the solution is that you once the once you have patrons involved, um, I, I the, the scaling is kind of an issue here because... Yeah. 
if you think about it, when you're going through a typical D and D session, all of your challenges are immediate. You know, there, there's, there's a, a berserker in your face with a sword. I need to deal with that. Like it's all short term in the next few moments, in the next 10 minutes, you know, by the end of today, I need to do X. But when you, when you step back to the patron style of play, now you shouldn't be thinking in terms of today I need to X. Yeah. You should really be thinking in terms of this week or this month, I need to accomplish this first goal so that I can establish my long-term goal, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a, a fledgling thieves guild and I want to take over the big thieves guild. Well, I don't need to worry about what's going on today. That's beneath my notice in the same way that, you know, yeah. Joe Biden doesn't care if your squad is... Yeah, or, you know, to, to use a historical example, George Bush didn't care if your squad was in the right block of Fallujah. <laughs> like, like his point is take Fallujah, right? Yeah. And then that plays out as, as a, you know, whatever it was, three month long backdrop during which our party of door kickers are worried about, you know, do we throw a grenade into the next room? We've only got a limited supply of grenades, right? We've got mm -hmm. that immediate problem. So that's the, I think that's one of the other things that people kind of lose sight of is, is that, you know, you want to micromanage a patron in the same way you do a PC and you really can't because that's not yeah. your role. Your role is management and resource allocation. And, and I think if you do that, then that's where the, I don't have to like worry about day-to-day orders. And, and I, I think that's important to point out too, is that like we went into December and Brovenloft and a number of these events knowing this is going to be bonkers, yeah. but it has a definitive end. Yes. And so you can do these like big epic 50 player games for a month, but they're not sustainable over the long term. But we now have this world of Brovenloft that people can dive into, have adventures and then dip back out again. To, to answer, I do want to answer, Paul Dalby has another good question. Um, and he asks this at 11.13. Uh, do any of the successful BroSR campaigns have 40 to 50 people? It sounds like they all have around 12 players. Um, that's a great question. And I can't answer that in the conventional style because you're thinking of B-Dub's campaign, which is called Dubs Are On. And Jeffro's campaign, which is called Trollopolis, except that the Trollopolis world is where Mandolf is running his campaign. And there's, um, you know, there's a, there's a, oh boy, there's a couple of other guys that are running campaigns. And because yeah. we are using the real world calendar to sync up events, we don't think of it as, you know, individual campaigns. They're all the same, like they're all connected in fun ways. It's and we have situate yeah we have situations where you know to, to go back to the to the story um at the start of trollopolis they jeffro said um elric is the boss of the city and three sessions later someone said you know if elric is there stormbringer is there <laughs> so when they killed elric the fluid the druid was like yoink and he took stormbringer and now you've got this artifact sword that caused all kinds of havoc and after like a year of play, and, and this was like, you know, we've got about 18 to 20 players that had moved through the table. They yeah. said, we're sick of it. They defeated the, 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 the one, you know, the, 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 the event happened. And they said, actually, it was one of the players betrayed the party. And they said, <laughs> we're going to banish the sword to, we're going to kill you and banish the sword. And he said, hey, 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 why don't you give me the sword? Stuff me in a well of many worlds. And then you'll be rid of it. It's out of the campaign forever. And one of the players at the table jokingly said, what if the well of world sent him to B-Dub's campaign? Because he would <laughs> yeah, wreck it. turned on someone saying, what if, right? Yeah, and, and everybody was like, oh, yeah, that's hysterical. That's exactly what happens. So Jeffro sends a little email. Hey, we sent uh, we sent the, sword, the Stormbringer to your campaign. And B-Dub's was like, oh, it's on, baby. It is on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> And because we were all using one-to-one -one time, you know, suddenly, you know, you've got that connection between the worlds and the PCs that, that ran around, um, 
and and that's why the sun turned off i think by the way so you still have repercussions yeah. from in all of like, them and, and and that goes back to what you were talking about earlier dunder that all goes back to the fact that in like session three the player said i want to talk to the boss of the city who is it yeah and the dm yeah. said it's elric Jeffro, because he's appendix n guy he just pulled somebody into his head yeah and, and we didn't realize at the time that <laughs> that would be the and 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 again what you're talking about is you throw out 50 ideas and enough people like the one we we don't even remember what the other 49 ideas are but we sure as hell remember Stormbringer because we are still dealing with that son of a well, and that was the thing, right? It's because that was you had a player in Dubs around that somehow had a spaceship. Yes. I don't understand. You can have Muppets and have spaceships yep. in this style of play. And he was like, I'm just this thing has caused so much trouble. I'm just gonna throw it into the sun. And that was that. Everyone thought it was over until one right. player was like, hang on a second. We're playing in Adventure Conquer King system in the RN setting. The sun yep. isn't just the sun, the sun is uh Aminar, the god of good in this in this setting and then it became well what happens if a sword that has the ability to suck the soul out of whatever it touches hits a god and then that set up your whole cosmic campaign right that you were doing right. for everybody how much pressure did you feel knowing there were multiple campaigns watching every post none it was it was as much fun as i've ever had the <laughs> the trick to that is that they they said can you run this cosmic battle so I said, all right, look, this here's what we're going to do to decide the outcome of this. I'm actually going to use a different war game and I'm going to play one turn and every turn represents a day in the real world. And here's one of the other issues that you get into. This is associated with one to one time as well. Um, sometimes you just have to accept that, that the thing has already happened and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And so the, the deal was. I'm going to, I can't like play and, and film and edit and upload a video a day. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to film this whole battle. So you tell me right now, if you want to have any influence in it and the battle is being fought in space. And if, if, if the good guys can get at their hands on the sword, they can prevent the bad guys from getting the sword. But if they don't, then the sword's going to kill the sun, God. Now, he's a demigod. He's not going to be dead forever. Don't worry. He'll get better, right? Six months from now. But the sun will be out for six months. Yeah. Um, so I, so as a as a fun mini game, and this is where there's no hard and fast rules. This is the beauty of tabletop role-playing games. There's no rule for this. So what do you do? Well, you you know, you figure out what would be interesting and, and you do it. And I, as I'm playing the battle, now, as a joke, again, B-dubs, he's pushing you to be, to do the best you can. B-Dub says, by the way, the, the forces of evil that have set out to grab the, the sword, they have the, the fishy-headed mutant goddess blah, 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 with her. Now, it's spelled Blibdul Poop, but he said, I'm going to put her in there because I want John to have to say Blibdul Poop constantly for the next <laughs> month. So I just pronounce it blah, 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 because that's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds um, like underwater when she says that's what, right? Exactly. Well, it, she wound up like in the tabletop battle, she got her hands on it and she ran off with it. Like in the middle of what should be a normal, like regular, who, which is side A going to win or side B? I said, well, there's this like unreliable ally that has the sword. Nobody wins. She runs off with it. So she ran, like she stabbed the sun on her way out the door. But now Stormbringer <laughs> is, is in the hands of Blibdul Pool. Because like the, the idea was if the good guys won, they were going to send it into Brovenloft, right? And then it would be a problem for that month. Right, right. They, that would be down that way. Yep, you know, it, and that could have happened, and and they would like find a way to seal the door to Brovenloft. And I, I honestly don't know what happened to it. The, that sword is still out there somewhere, <laughs> just waiting to cause more trouble. Just yeah. the fact that we talked about it is probably going to be bad for everyone watching. Yeah, yeah, and you know, so that's th that's where you just um. We we're kind of getting a little bit off the, the patron play topic, but that's where that's that's how patron play works. Right. Yeah. Is I, you know, I don't I don't really know how that like I don't like I, I'm thinking castle building because that's one of those things that we all dream of. You design your castle and then eventually. But we you never think, well, 
but but if you're doing stop time, you just okay, he's got a castle. We waited three years. But if you have to maintain that construction site for three years, yeah, yeah that's a logistics problem. But fly lines. Yeah. Even so, I have a mini in my solo campaign. I have a little mini game. I rolled up a crater and I was talking about this on Twitter. And I said, okay, so here's the mini game that I'm playing with myself. I'm going to have to hire somebody to help me dig this up. So one of my PCs has to come up with enough money and have enough time to go out into the wilderness and dig a shaft to find the meteorite that's there. But maybe it's not a meteorite. And until I get there, I'll never know what's there. Yeah. But now I have like this fun side quest that I can do. And I think that may be the other way to look at this is think of it the way you think of like Skyrim, that you've got these things going on in the background. And do they really influence you? They don't until you move into that area and start, yeah. you know, affecting it. So I have this like mini game set up where at some point I'll need supply lines. It'll take a month to dig it up. And if wandering monsters come by and I haven't allowed for that, you know, my people are all going to get totally ghost and darkness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to have to hire, a, you know, um, two lions will just show up yeah. and wreck them. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to hire Val Kilmer to come and, and yeah. play bait so that uh, what's his face can shoot the, the two lions. Right. But that's interesting. That's an adventure. And you can't, so, you know, the, it, it all happens organically. Just let it come to you guys. And I feel like that's the real currency. Like, you know, there's this whole thing on about prep versus no prep and like conventional players making a story and then dragging you through it um, in a, a organic campaign like this. There's the rules, there's the campaign, there's the players. But the real I feel like the real currency and we've been talking around it for a bit is um, player excitement. The currency is what little idea gets tossed out there that everyone thinks that would be amazing. And now it has to happen that way. Right. Like, oh, we've got Elric there's the sword you know all those little moments where someone was like actually that would mean and then you run with it yes and, and that's exactly what happens and it's it's um the 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 seeds that get watered are the plants that will flower hmm. plant as many seeds as you can and then have the patience to see what bears fruit um and and it it will happen and and gary talks about this a little bit in in ad and d that you know the better players will be better at coming up with engaging personalities and scenarios let it happen because i you know uh, there, there's also a weird thing that happens at tabletop rpgs where people assume that everyone wants the spotlight all the time and how do we share the spotlight and i gotta be honest you know sometimes i sit down to a session and i'm not feeling it man i'm like look I want to roll some dice. I, I want to kill some orcs. That What do you guys want to do? I was frustrated in, in third edition because I uh, the campaign that I played in, I could only make it like every third session. And so my solution was, well, why don't I just play a spear carrier and I'll be the, um, you know, the poncho, or the, is it Sancho to, to yeah. Don Quixote over here. And no one at the table had any interest in that. They were like, I don't want the responsibility of you being you know, my, my servant. And I was like, well, I, you know, just tell me what you guys need to do. I'm, I'm not as engaged. Yeah, that's fine. I don't want to drive this. Like the one time I took an active interest in, and did something, everybody got mad at me. And I was like, well, I didn't know what was going on. So, <laughs> you know, you had your chance to, to boss me around and you said, no, so don't get mad at me for, you know, for doing the thing. It's okay to be an introvert. You can still play D&D. Yeah. &D. We need to allow that in this hobby a little more. Right on. Well, man, uh, I've already pulled you half an hour past the uh, the the time. That's for all this. right. Dude. I feel like we could go for for more time as well because it is just fun talking with you and picking your brain and seeing how. I mean, likewise. I I uh, I really wish I'd have been around for the crazy stuff that happened with, when all the campaigns connected and stuff. But I have I've really benefited from my time in the Broasar. Well, and I'm glad you're here, Dunder Moose. You know, the more perspectives we have, and you, you've asked a lot of really insightful questions that I'm going to have to listen to this later because <laughs> there's some things we need to think about. And and I think, you know, don't, to the people that are watching, don't be afraid to experiment at your tables and don't be afraid to share, even with the Bro SR, if it doesn't work. I think the real thing is to, to you know, just, just 
check your ego at the door. I know that sounds weird coming from one of the bro SR, but you know, we, <laughs> we, we, we it, B dubs doesn't admit when he makes mistakes, but he doesn't make mistakes, right? Guys like me, we, we have to learn from it and, and you know, and, and move forward and, you know, right on. Don't, don't be shy about it. We're, we're all trying, you know, it's, we're all fighting our own private battles, guys. Don't take it too seriously. All right, that's a good thought to end on. Um, I do want to say, like, if you have that that is the spirit of the stairway where you're like, oh, I should have said this or whatever, you are, you have a standing invitation. You're welcome to come back anytime. Uh, <laughs> let me know. Right on. I would love to. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, whatever time zone you're in, uh, I really had fun with this conversation, and I hope to see you guys for the next one. Praying for you. Oh, yeah. One more <laughs> Take thing. Take care, guys. No, I'm sorry. Before yes. I end. If is there if people are like man I cannot get enough Mr. Wargame and I cannot I cannot get enough of this guy, uh, how else can they support you? Where else can they uh, they look you up? I, I know we've got here's the the for the Orc Lords. Here's your website. Here's your YouTube, Joy of Wargaming. Yep. And there's your website. And that's that's right there. It is. Yep. That's what, the website. What would be of the course, most meaningful way to support you right now. Uh, I I don't know. Um, you know thoughts and prayers and well wishes um that, that that like i i'm not doing this for the money i'm doing it for love um right on you know make, make sure make sure you for those of you that this is like if you came here for me then there's just hit the subscribe like comment do the youtube shuffle for dunder what, what's your subscriber <laughs> count out right now um last i checked it was 80 people oh come on we can do better than that you guys are embarrassing me be, be better do better give him a follow he, he yeah that that's the best way. And, and i and i'm being dead serious here like you asked me the best way to support me the more we have voices like dunder moose out here asking these hard questions and being willing to talk to lots of different people not just the latest rainbow rainbow brigade the more open-minded we are and the more sharing we do the better off this hobby is for all of us so if you want to support me make the hobby better if you want to make the hobby better give this guy some support he needs it i appreciate it man Take care, brother. Love Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again.